Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are here again with another conversation that matters. I'm your host, Ricardo McRae. Into that question of the secrets of selling creative work. Like, what does it take to have people buy into your ideas as a client or even uh, when you're in a business? So, Matt, I'll introduce you first. Uh, what's that? I said hello. What's up, Matt? He is a freelancer here in Toronto has his background, starting with people like Ogilvy that you might have heard of, uh, and has worked with Draft FCB, the Extreme Group, uh, and different companies here in Toronto, some of the top agencies, and has a lot of experience working in creating work in that environment. Uh, Askia Jones. Oh, a little known fact about Matt, that he is unaware that I'm about to share with the world. <laughs> Where are you going with this? <laughs> Matt, I have some pictures. So I'm just going to share them. And, oh, uh, pictures. <laughs> I'm joking, man. He oh, likes oh my gosh. masks. You know those masks that you wear when you're wrestling with the big patterns on them? Like the, what, what are those called? The Nacho Libre. Nacho yeah. Libre, yeah. Nacho Libre man. Oh. Got I've got a few of those. <laughs> he <Yeah>. loves them. <laughs> Awesome. Matt's a character. We love him, and thanks for joining us, man. The Askia, uh, brand consultant, entrepreneur, and has over 20 years' experience. Uh, has done work for ESPN, the New York Times, and most recently sold his company, uh, his branding company. So congrats. Nothing like being acquired when the price is right. So price is right. <laughs> well done. So, yeah, man. Thanks for joining me, guys. And today we're just going to get into this conversation around, you know, how do you sell your work? And I'm not just talking about as an entrepreneur, how do I create something and then sell that? But how do you sell it within an agency? How do you get buy-in from a client? How do you get buy-in from your boss? How do you get buy-in from your team? Uh, who wants to jump in? Who wants to go first? Okay, I'll go first. Yeah. <laughs> um, Where are you? The whole creative process for me as a writer starts with a brief. It's usually been vetted by the client. Um, it's gone through strategy, so there's a bunch of good thinking in there. And, and I find that oftentimes when we get that brief, nobody gets as intimate with it as the creatives do. It's, it, it becomes very quick when, there's, when something doesn't sound right or something doesn't fit or it's a little bit awkward. Um, oftentimes, strategy can sound one way, but uh, when you start to actually think about it and put the pen to paper to try to ideate against that strategy, you start to, to think, well, it, it actually works a little bit better like this. So there's some tweaking that starts to happen. Right. And how are you uh, so that's, back and forth with a client when this has happened? So they have a concept, you start working on it, you're like, yeah, this has got to go. We got to get this down to a sentence, not a paragraph. Yeah, uh, and then it's just it's it's very much internal. You work with the strategy team, you work with your creative director, right. and it's just a lot of time spent. I've I've heard somebody use the analogy: just opening opening doors. Right. You just open as many doors as you can to try to solve the problem in meaningful and relevant ways. Mm. Uh, always keeping their need in mind. You never want to go off and say, "Hey, you should do this." They they are coming to you with an ask. Ultimately end of the day you have to come back and, and meet that ask right right and a ski is that the same when you're dealing with uh, let's say design you know Matt's coming in from you know, writing what about when you're design or you're doing creative in a different yeah. sense I, th I think there's a lot of similarities um, you, you mentioned the the agency um, component and I think we've all had that experience where there, there's two pitches so to speak you have the internal pitch right actually internal pitches where you know where so many where the groups get together and if there is a particular rfp or a particular piece of business that we're going after we have to first figure out what is that idea that we can all rally behind and then sell that to you know pitch that to the client so first is it's the internal pitch you know it's 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 the collaboration internally with your designers and your copywriters and your art directors and your creative directors. And, you know, um, you know, the last agency I worked for before I started my own business, we had this inclusive policy where we believe that ideas can come from anywhere. 
you know, we, 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 we ingratiated ourselves with everyone, you know, human resources, right. the county, because we felt as though that in today's society, particularly with social media, is all about connection. And there may be a there may be some way that the person in human resources or accounting may be able to add so much great value because they may be the, the, actually the person that may purchase this product or need the third of the picture. Now, how much is much? You, I mean, we're talking about you know bringing other people in, getting that feedback. At what point it goes from feedback to fire hose? And it's like, all right, we've, we've, we've had enough of this. You know, we just need to, to to hunker down and do it. I just see Charles Senior join us. So welcome, Charles. How are you doing? I think from the oh, I'm Tim, Tim, oh, Tim. I haven't seen Tim in ages. But back to the I business. think from oh, the client going. side, I don't know. I think you're always the, the fire hose is always ready, right? You know, you know, once once you right. once you get that Everybody client, you know, it, it's almost like the the spigot is on, you know. But and you and you're hoping you don't have to like let it loose. And maybe you hope and yeah. maybe just keep it at a slow drip, you know what I mean? So that you know right. all you have to do is just kind of put out little baby. It's it's like, do I want to put out fires or do I want to have prescribed burns? You know what I'm saying? You know, prescribed burnings is, is a lot more easier than dealing with fires because sometimes because you control it, you control where the fire goes, and sometimes you ignite it in order to make sure that the, the burn is going in the direction where it needs to be. It's, it, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean. Matthew you think of like uh, Keith Richards, Mick Jagger. That's a duo. Uh, and when I work with my partner, I think that's exactly what we do is we start the fire that people can then start to dance around. That's it. You, you need to have it. I go. think it's, it's, it's the initial concept is never a democracy. You really have to have it where it's two people sitting down in a room, okay. being as smart as they can to solve a problem. And from there, inviting other people in. And then the, uh, like, uh, you have to have, first of all, is we'll go to our creative director. That's the first fight. Got to convince that person. Once they're convinced, right. then we go to the account team. Convince that person. Eventually, strategy will come in. Oftentimes, later in the game, which can be difficult because, you know, in my experience, it's a busy bunch. They come in later. They have to be bought off on it. Different levels within the account side have to buy off on it. Then you go to client after all of that. But to lead that, you need. Okay. And all of those steps, you get to the client. The client's like, yeah, I kind of want something that looks exactly like this thing that I saw last week on YouTube. Could you guys, like, make it what look exactly do? like that, but, like, a little What different? are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I like that, though. You know, think about it. At the end of the day, the client only knows what they see okay right. we talk about storytelling all the time you know we use the word story and it's true we're all storytelling whether we're writers designers art directors creative directors um the, the role we play in this creative process we're, we're, we're storytellers but the thing we forget is that just like any movie like i love captain america civil war but so, that may not be some people's type of movie. Some people may prefer chick flicks. Some people may prefer action. Some people may, may prefer horror movies. Why do they prefer those movies? Because those movies connect with them. It, well, at the end of the day, what we, what we forget as storytellers is that our job is to figure out how do we connect with people? How do we connect with the client? How do we make the client believe that we actually... that? How, how do we get them to believe that we actually believe what they believe in? You right. know what I mean? And so the reason why I like that question is because it's always so important to understand that the client will come to you and say, well, I saw this. Well, that's what they saw. That's what they connected with. And that's what inspired them. But it's our job right. then as professionals to say, okay, I see what inspired you. I see what got your, your you excited. Now let me take my expertise, sit with you, study your study your mission, study your business, study your service, and now let's figure out if those things are relevant. Then we'll figure out pieces of that that's relevant. But it's my job to say, you know what? Based on what I've assessed, this is the direction we need to go in. If they connect with that, they'll get just as excited with that idea as the idea they presented to you. Mm. Yeah, that's you got. Is that, is that what you exactly? You found, 
got to sit down with the client and try to figure out what, what's in their head. Oftentimes, the client has a lot of other things that right. they're thinking about. Marketing is only 15% of their day-to-day -day stuff. They've got to make sure inventory is getting into the country. They've got to make sure that stuff's right. getting onto the shelves. They're, they have a they have a lot of balls in the air. And, uh, and it's not fair for me yeah. to paint with such a broad strokes to say that it's not their skill to, to articulate what they want, but oftentimes they know what they want. They can't describe it. They, yeah. That's it. They can't, that's it. It's, I was having this discussion with someone actually just yesterday about, uh, I was at the Art Gallery of Ontario interviewing this artist, and he has created these beautiful, beautiful paintings. And everyone's like, so what about your process? And what did you think of that drip on the left-hand side? You're just getting into all of this minutia. And I'm like, hey, hey, how do you feel about it? And people have this hard time with just saying, you know what, I just feel this is the right way we should go with things. And as creatives, we can just throw some stuff out. We can get creative, just let it be and not have a reason for every single thing being where it is. And I think sometimes people in corporate uh, or even clients have a hard time with, I just feel that it's right versus show me a spreadsheet. What's the ROI of that? Why is that word here? Like, tell me those brand code. They just get caught up in this minutia. It's like, just how do you begin to articulate feelings when someone's coming from the logic side of things? Uh, tell me about, who wants to jump in? Any one of you can jump in. And before we do that, I just want to let everyone know who's watching, if you have questions, please write them in the section on the right-hand side. And uh, if you want to jump in and really ask a question live, click the call-in button and uh, we will chat with you and see what's going on. So yeah, who wants to jump in on that? That whole notion of like, how do you begin to describe or communicate creativity to someone who is coming from that logic perspective? Well, I'll add to that. It's, it's interesting to use the word logic. Uh, Zig Ziglar said that People don't buy for logical reasons. They buy for emotional reasons, which is so mm. true. Um, the logic is I, I need to increase my ROI. The logic is I need to get out of the red. The logic is right. I need to increase sales. We understand the logic from when the client comes to us. But now what right. we have to do is we have to figure out a way, how do we retell their story? I mean, the... The, the story of Coca-Cola, Aflac, uh, McDonald's, it hasn't changed. It's the same. The history is, it, it is what it is. Our job is to figure out how do we retell the story in a way that is relevant today so that it can connect right. with the right people today. I always tell people, when clients come to me and they say, I want to rebrand, I say, no, you don't. You want to reconnect. <laughs> no, no, seriously, you want to reconnect. Yeah. You know, and I tell them that brands does great brands begin with words, not design. Great brands yeah. begin with word, words that are visual, words that inspire, and words that connect. For give me an example of, of one that that's your great favorite. example. Um, okay, <laughs> even if you do say so yourself, <laughs> give me a um, Mercedes Benz. Their slogan is the best or nothing, right? Now, Subaru's slogan is confidence in motion. Two car brands, right? Now, you all three of us are probably familiar, and we probably analyzed and studied that Subaru commercial where you have these, these cars that look like the Hulk just stepped on them, right? And then you have the tow guy, and he looks at and, he's, and you have these people looking at these cars like, oh, my God, the family must be dead. But the guy says they live. They, and then you see another situation, the guy says they live. And then you see through compensation. Well, what you're mm. saying is the value even is in is not necessarily in the luxury of the car. It's who's in the car seat. It's who's in the passenger side. Those are words that create a visual and that connect with people. Well, right. Mercedes is saying the best or nothing. They're saying, you know, look, man, you know, it's about luxury. It's about style. It's about class. It's about you getting this car. I feel like you've arrived. But you know we build a great product still. You know we build a safe, reliable product. But that's not who we're connecting with. We're connecting. Well, that's not why they're connecting. Exactly. With 
the foregone conclusion that it's a solid brand, but it's the best. It's the or best nothing. or nothing. Of course, it's the best or nothing. And and so those right. are the differentiating marks. And what we have to do is figure out what are those differentiating marks where we can find the most equity in, and then we build off that. So if we know that Subaru is trying to build a brand on safety. It's like we said earlier, well, and, and Matt said it so eloquently. It doesn't matter if someone comes to you and say, oh, I like this cool thing. Can you do this and do that? Well, if it doesn't speak mm-hmm. to safety, if it doesn't speak to your brand, and we recognize that those are the people you need to connect with, and we need to first figure out what are the words. What's your positioning statement? Rolex. I love Rolex. Their, their mission statement is a crown for every achievement, which means every time you, you get to a certain milestone, you buy that new Rolex. Right. You see right. what I'm saying? So that's what I mean by, yeah. you know, finding those words and understanding that great brands have to begin with words and not with design. Yeah, no, I'm, I agree Magical. with everything. I'm trying to think of from my perspective, obviously as a writer, I totally agree. One of my uh, first things I do after receiving a brief or when I start to try to figure out what a problem is, is just trying to write, what would the tagline be from there? What would the billboard be? Build yes. You know, you got to keep yes. it to eight words. So yes. it forces you to mm. write something so simple and succinct <laughs> that oftentimes you can use that as your diving board into something a little bit bigger. And and, and that notion of like eight words and, and being succinct, how long does That's it take to cut. come up with eight words? And is this something that could be, you know, are you putting in like 10 hours? Is it a day? Is it 10 minutes? Like, what does that take to come up with That's eight always, words? That's always say it's as, yeah. the billboard is the purest form of advertising. Um, yeah, it could take, mm-hmm. some have taken forever. <laughs> there's, there's some I'm still like, oh, I wish I would have cracked that one. <laughs> um, but I want to go back to you were talking about yeah. you're at the AGO yeah. and you're analyzing art. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I often have friends say, you know, it's, yeah. oh, it's really cool. You work in advertising, you get to be creative all day. And, and I like to think that the only difference between myself and the other person who thinks advertising is really cool, the similarity is we're both creative. I think the difference is, is I'm trained to recognize when my creativity is actually being focused and being used properly. So you think of somebody at the AGO, there is no wrong answer to painting a painting. You can just let it go. You're not answering to anyone except yourself. Mm-hmm. Is when I think when you're trying to to do something for a client, right. you're being creative, but you do have to look at things through a certain lens. It's a focused creativity. Got you. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Very true. It's, it's I call that uh, the sandbox. First thing I want to do when I sit down with a client is like, what are the edges of this thing that we are making and where are we designing Tell me the limits of your brand. Like, what do you have? Like, what assets have you got? I want to get in there and get my hands dirty with everything so we can see where the edges are. And then you start playing within that space because the worst thing you can do for creativity, I think, is really just say, the size is the limit to whatever you yeah. want. I'm like, bad yeah. idea. Yeah. That's just like, okay, nothing's going to happen. It's like, we've got to see the edges and then you get in that box and you play. So it's it's interesting how... Everybody wants to get outside of the box in corporate, but creative people are sitting here going, we need a box. It's yeah, very well, I'll tell you, limits. you know, we in our know. industry, awards <laughs> matter a lot. Trying to win awards is always great for yeah. the agency you're with. It's great for your for yourself. It's uh, That's how you move up mm-hmm. in the game. And nothing is more frustrating than a creative director who says, let's win some awards. Do something. Yeah, no, very true. So, I mean, I think Anything a smart creative will something. put themselves like, in a box. Up. But just to have that open space, just to be able to do anything, you're like, oh, creativity sometimes comes through a little bit of necessity when you have certain tools at your disposal or or not. Impression. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the absence of them. Or not. Yeah. 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 All right. Someone was trying to call in. Who was that? Who had a question? Beata. Beata. Hey, welcome, Beata. Uh, if you want to click call in, you can ask your question live. If you click the call in button again, Beata, you can join. If anybody else has a question, feel free to jump on in. Hi to everyone who is here. Welcome. Who do we have? Let's say hi to a few people. 
Molly. Welcome, Molly. Dr. Vibe. Vantos inside his head. Rachel Lee Rickards. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Dr. Vibe's calling in. What's your first. question, Dr. Vibe? Welcome to the yeah. show, man. Hey, what is up, gentlemen? How we doing? One in. I am Hello. blessed and happy. I'm going to keep it short because I know people are going to be barging. First of all, thank you, Ricardo, Askia, and Matt for doing this. It's essential and very important for us to get your evaluated experience. But I want to ask each one of you, what is the biggest misconception about branding today that you encounter? <laughs> Only one? <laughs> That's why I asked the question. <laughs> I would say the biggest, the most common, the biggest mistake people make think is that their logo is their <laughs> oh, brand. Man. You took one of mine. <laughs> I'm going to take that right off yeah. the table. My, like your logo is not your brand and they mm. always want the logo bigger. I'm like... Unless you're in the business of selling logos, dude, like, calm down. <laughs> so that's mine. I'm going to tap out with okay, that easy one. one. Go ahead, Jim. It's that. I'm going to throw you all to the wolves. A lot of the times when working on projects, I feel that people are so close to their own work that they think everybody cares. Mm, good point. But you have to understand <laughs> good. most people don't care. They don't care about what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man! Yeah, come on! Come on! Come on! You got the calendar now, so come on, man! <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say the biggest misconception is that, and I'm gonna say it for those that are in the industry, not necessarily for those that are out. Those that are coming in, I don't understand that. Uh, when I mentor young guys coming in, I tell them something very important. I said, "We're matchmakers." Mm -hmm. Uh, our job is to make two entities fall in love with each other. You know, whoever that consumer is that you're targeting and that service or that product. Um, the best, uh, Denise Lee Young, I love this. She's a great, a great creative. She has a quote. The quote says, great brands aim for customers' hearts, not their wallets. And what she's saying is that when you understand branding and you understand the importance of connecting, you realize that um it's not really about trying to figure out how much money i can make or how many whatever this thing i'm i'm doing i'm trying to sell because mm -hmm. money is the byproduct of the relationship that you connect with with your brand so when you build a brand the key is how do i connect you know um that's why i was saying earlier a lot of times when clients come to me and they say well i'm trying to re i need to rebrand i'm like no you need to reconnect because somewhere there was a lapse where you stopped doing what you said that you, you, you were doing for that particular uh, customer or client. You were no longer meeting that expectation or you've grown and now there's a different market or, or segment that, can, that, 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 that has identified that your product or service has value and you haven't even spoken to them yet. You haven't connected to them yet. So that's what I would say, but you know, Ricardo said the one that hit the top of my head because I was forced to work on a particular project and I did this logo for this company and the company comes up to me and he says, oh my gosh, you know, everybody loves this logo, man. This, this logo, you did. and then he says, this brand that you created for us, this brand is so phenomenal. Everybody loves this brand. I'm like, I didn't create the brand. And he just paused. He looks at me like he lost. I said, you're the brand. I created a mark. I created a logo type. You know, you know, and that's why I always tell people, and I'll end it on this. Brands are not what you say you are. Brands are what they say you are. You, Everybody give them you know, and, and that's the biggest thing. That's the most important thing. I understand. I, I, I'm going to jump off because I think after that, people, you better just keep jumping on in right now because that is, that is money from each one of those gentlemen. That is money from each one of those gentlemen. No problem. Good stuff. In, Doctor, Have a good one, Ben. All right. Anybody else has any more questions or anything they want us to jump in on? Feel free. Jump in on the seat. I know Beata's out there. You were trying to call in a minute ago. Feel free to jump in. 
Uh, who else do we have out here? Y'all better call in, man. We got some big timers up here. I know can not only see us, but I've got uh, my creator director echo. Come pacing on, Jamie. like a no, shark behind me. I don't know if you caught that. <laughs> Why is What's he going typing? on? Why is that? What's Matt doing? <laughs> I hope that's a project you're working on right now. All right. Yeah, so let's, uh, any other questions? Like what, uh, what else is going on? Well, um, one thing I would like to say is, uh, you know, we, we did this exercise earlier in the black with Carter and I, and I'd like to share it with people because I, 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 I sit, I sit on the outside in, in a lot of blabs sometimes and they're talking about branding and, and sometimes I just want to be like, ah, what are y'all talking about? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you, you're steering these people in the wrong direction. These people are going to, you know, you're hurting these people. And you know, Matt says something that I love. I, I, and I, I, I know Ricardo may have picked up on it, but it hit me like a ton of bricks. Well, you mentioned the eight words. And the first thing he mentioned was he mentioned the billboard as, a, as an example. But he said, yeah. he said, he said, he used it. He, he used the words advertising for that billboard. And I think that's very important. Because a lot of times people don't understand the difference between marketing, branding, and advertising. They put them all in one bubble. And it goes right. back to what this exercise, and I'll share real quick, is if if Matt comes up to um, Ricardo and says, hey, you know, I'm a really good writer. I'm a fantastic writer. I'm a great writer. And he does all the time. And I'm pretty sure he does. Mean, Look how humble he is. Have I told you guys you know how mean? good of a writer I and, am? Uh, is this a good first, opportunity? A big deal. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't told us. And today, we haven't heard you know. it today. Never heard it today. But if a, but if Matt told Ricardo that, that's marketing, because what he's doing is he's he's trying to um, he's putting himself out there. He he's made, he's creating a, a sense of visibility by saying, "Hey, if you need a writer." You know, if you come across a particular project, I can be that guy. I just want to let you know I'm a really good writer. Now, if Ricardo comes to me and says, hey, man, you know, Matt, man, I, you know, I know you got a little design agency. Matt's a really good writer. So if you need writing, man, you know, you may want to holler at Matt. That's PR. Because now what he's become is based on that experience working with Matt. He's become a brand ambassador of Matt. And, and he's like, and he's telling everybody, hey, you know, if you need a good writer, Matt's your guy. If, and this is what I love about when you mentioned advertising. If Matt says, I'm a good writer, 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 that's advertising because it's about placement. I got to put it on a billboard, media display ad, brochure. I got to put it anywhere, but with the appropriate amount of spacing where it sticks so that it, and where, wherever it is, it connects with that right person. It's about placement. But if I come to Matt and I say, Matt, I understand you are a really good writer. That's branding. Because, like I said, branding is not what you say you That's are. Right, yeah. Branding is what others say you are. And now, based on that experience that I've had with Matt and what others have had with Matt, I have now connected with him. And I understand that this dude is a really good writer. And I, and I say all that to say this. When you want to build your brand, or whatever it is, or sell your creative work, you have to connect with people. You have to find that group of people that you that you have identified as your target, and you have to make mm -hmm. sure you connect with that people and you serve those people. When you do that, then the money becomes the byproduct of that connection. Right. So true. It's it's the money is the is the result or the it's someone asked a question very similar to that. They said, uh, "How do you get something to go viral?" I'm like. Viral is an outcome. It is not sort of a mission. It's like it's like a bonus. Like if you get viral after you do work, yeah. Yeah. awesome yeah. sauce. But you can't start by saying create a viral campaign for me. It's, the best you can do is create something with the intent to be viral, but you can't make it viral. It has to happen organically. You cannot. It's just. I said, put something out with a cat. Exactly. It'll go viral. <laughs> Red flag. Red flag when someone not, says that. Yeah, yeah. We need a viral campaign, okay? All right, I need to leave this meeting. <laughs>
back away from the but, 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 but you know what? Then what you tell them is then allow let me figure out what you do. Let's figure out who your audience is and let's figure out how to connect with that audience. Because if you connect mm-hmm. with them, then they begin to what spread that that message. And then right. you have a higher percentage of whatever that is that you're trying to do may become viral, may not, but now you've increased the opportunity. Yep. So Nick has a question here on the side. Nick, do you want to jump in and ask your question? Come on in, Nick. Don't be shy. Come on in, Nick. Let's, let's do this live, man. Let's talk. There's nothing like a little face-to-face. Just had a comment from the other side. As an owner of a company, the only thing you actually have to do as the owner is to identify your product and customer. If you're not clear about managing those two things, personally, you're pretty much doomed to fail. Come on, Matt, jump in here. Yeah, Let's I'm talk about that one that. over again. Yeah. So who wants who wants to, to jump in on that? Like, As a business owner, he's saying, I need to know my product and I need to know my customer and connecting those two. Let's see, right. show callers. <laughs> my wife's going to be running back and forth in the background now, so... <laughs> How you doing? Well, how are you guys doing today? How are you doing, Nick? <laughs> doing? I live in Colorado. Great. Good, man. Where are you calling in from? Yeah. Colorado. Welcome. Welcome. So you're a business owner. Tell us more, man. What's, so my what's, product, uh, what's your product and who are your customers? And my customers are those people that love it, really. And it's not even something, I mean, the reason I had, yeah. The reason I said that comment is it took me years of doing business before I realized that I wasn't important at all, that the brand wasn't even me. Yeah, I have to identify the brand, but it's not me. What I like is completely irrelevant. <laughs> you said, what, what do you, what do well, you mean I, by you said like, the brand is not you? you your customers are ultimately the people you're serving if you want to. If you want to make money. I mean, if you don't want to make money, go ahead and serve yourself all day long. <laughs> but otherwise, your customers are the people that are paying for the service. So there is a point about two, a year and a half ago where I realized I was completely irrelevant to the whole equation. The brand wasn't me. The customer wasn't me. I just needed to find out what the customer want and create the brand that they wanted. And that was it. <laughs> but, you know, I will add to this. And I, I, I completely understand that thought process. But I would say this. Um, Great brands, particularly brands that connect, they write about you. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said brands begin with words. As a brand, my job is to find is to write about Mm -hmm. you and you become a part of my narrative. And so their story becomes your story. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't remove you from being the brand. It just means that you have ingratiated yourself and said that I'm going to make sure that I that this brand that I'm building or this service or this product, whatever it is, it holistically mm-hmm. speaks to that group so that they understand that um, they are a part. For example, think about, I, I'm telling my age when I say this commercial, but you know, when I was a kid, my favorite commercial was uh, Coca-Cola's commercial. I like to teach the world to sing in perfect <laughs> harmony, like to buy the world a Coke. Oh, oh. Coca Cola, you know what I'm saying? So, um, but the beautiful aspect of that commercial was that you had all these people, right? I don't even know how many, like probably 100 people, and they were all different nationalities, different races, everyone. None of them looked alike, none of them dressed alike. They really showed their ethnicity, you know, within that, within that, that, that collage. But the one thing they had in common, the common thread, was they all had a ball of Coke in their hand. Mm-hmm. So what Coca-Cola mm-hmm. was saying is that all these people are different. They some of them probably didn't even have a conversation Coca-Cola. together, you know. But the yeah. one thing, the common thread mm-hmm. that connects them all is our product. They all love this brand because this brand allows them for this very moment to be able to come together in perfect harmony. <laughs> and so all of, I say all that to say this is that. I understand that logic and I, and I'm not going to say, and you know, and I get it, but I think what I what can become problematic is if you remove yourself as being the brand, 
then what happens is you allow the the voices as they grow to maneuver you into a space where maybe is not the best place to go for your product or service. Yeah. Now, let me jump in on that real quick. As you say, the voice and who's controlling who is, is the customer demand driving where the business goes or are you creating something and you're putting it into the world and saying, who wants to buy this? Come and see me. I'm going in this direction. So, and I'll add to that as well. Is it a personal brand or is it a company that's branded? So something like Apple has a business brand, but there's also this icon of ego that is driving all of this stuff. Microsoft has mm -hmm. a brand and less so about the person behind it. You can, it's, and Apple is it's just, proof of that. Can you have a brand without a person? Apple as a number one brand when Steve Jobs died five years ago. You know, that is that is proof of a good brand. It's not, Steve Jobs yeah. created a brand to such a level that it could continue on with Steve Cook managing it. Or isn't Steve Cook CEO? No, does it start yeah, the, with current, oh Tim Cook? That's the current, name I was yeah. talking about. Tim Cook. Does it start the current with CEO? Well, yeah. as the does it start with the CEO, person? Or does it start job with the business to does... manage the brand identity? Where I see the line get blurred, and why I see a lot of people fail is either they think that they're the brand identity, like Steve Jobs, and then when Steve Jobs dies, the whole thing's over. Or they don't ever, they don't even look at the brand identity, or they don't look at the customer. But like you have to, you you do have to manage that. That's like fundamental. You need to understand what your product is, and you do need to understand your customer and the brand that creates that communication. But if you don't, if you if you make it too personal, then you're going to not be able to maneuver to places that you want to, that your company needs to go to have success. Like Steve, a perfect example of this is with Apple. Steve yeah. Jobs knew what he wanted Apple to be when he started back in 1980s. And he wanted to create the iPad back then. And it took, and he actually was capable of creating the iPad when he made the first right. iPhone. But he knew that it met with his brand identity and the customers wanted the iPhone, not the iPad. And so he made that one first. Yeah, you know, I, I often have to wear different hats when working on the amount of clients that I do in any given year. And sometimes I have to wear the hat of, uh, of someone who uses tampons. <laughs> I have to wear the hat of a woman who has three children. A little known fact about that. A little yeah, known a fact. parent who has three children. A woman, uh, you know, a stay-at-home mom that has three children. I'm going to share that on Twitter right now. And, that was really good. and I mean, no, that was really good though. That was really good. I, uh, you have to put yourself in that situation and, and try to think strategically what matters to these people. What do these people value? And, uh, I can't even see it going the other way. I can't imagine going into a meeting with work that is that, that I, that appeals to me for some of these products. You definitely have to separate yourself from the two of them. And yeah. I feel like the example of using tampons is sort of the, the extreme example. But hey, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that's out there. That, um, Can you actually do that, though, if, if you don't even use or have personal need for a product? Can you actually build a brand or build a message for that in an authentic way that's actually going to connect with a woman? <laughs> My, my personal example of the Chinese medicine thing, I don't take Chinese medicine. I've never been into it. It's, the reason I got into that business was, because it was largely because I was able to operate more effectively because it was impersonal. And that was just, it was just a, something I came to. that, And I learned from coaches and stuff from my side that that was my responsibility. When I started having to outsource more work, they were like, look, this is the stuff you can't outsource. And that was why I made the comment I made. But... Yeah, you can do stuff you have no experience with and do it better. Yeah. Like my brand is quickly becoming a lot more engaging than the people I'm competing against because I don't use this stuff. <laughs> but but you but you know what? that outsider's edge or the rookie's edge, as I like to know, say, is like I don't I know. Get, I, I get Nick's 
I understand now what Nick is saying, and it makes perfect sense now because one of the things when, when I used to do these brand sessions with startups, I used to tell them, okay, I used to have these things I call the five P's. Usually they can go up to, to like six or seven, but I would narrow it down. And the first P I would say is what is your priority, which is the pro. And I love what Matt said earlier. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? That's the number one. You know, you know, mm-hmm. they ha- you know, if you're starting a business, what you know, there ha- if, what is the priority? Now the pro- the priority now goes into these other two P's, potential or passion. Is it something you're passionate about, or is it something you see the potential in making money? Well, it looks like you identify that you're not in the passion direction. You're in the potential of making money. And so you went into that, which is nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely no, that is an entrepreneur. That, that is saying that I, I've seen it. I see a, a gap that need to be filled and I have the ability to be able to fill that gap, fill that need. And I'm going to take advantage of that. Nothing wrong with that. So, so now hearing that it makes perfect sense because it is not a brand that you have necessarily identified a problem as it relates to, okay, man, this is something that I've dealt with. This is something my friends have dealt with. This is something, man, that, man, you know, it just makes me uncomfortable at night or this, this, blah, blah, blah. This is something you, you woke up one morning or you saw something, you were exposed to something, you said, whoa, I can do this and make a it- lot of money. So then you understand that you're not, and now I see what you meant by you saying that I'm not the brand because you built a business where it's about filling a, a need and not necessarily yeah. solving a problem. So and all businesses you know ultimately have to fill a need, whether you happen to fill that need by solving a problem for the first time is right. kind of the reason I got I'm into totally Chinese agree. medicine, just to be completely clear about it is because it's snake oil. Everybody in the business world says this is snake oil, right? And so there's an opera. And then the people who are into it are trying to convert people. No, this isn't snake oil. That's like the whole dynamic. You've got people on one side that are like, this isn't snake oil. The other side that says this is snake oil. And meanwhile, the quality control in the product is just gone because they're either trying to convert people to snake oil or they're trying to say this is snake oil and i came in and created said begun creating a brand that's growing pretty quickly that is instead of dealing with the snake oil question just dealing with quality control that's the only that is the brand is quality control with with food products that's everything and essentially the fda says this stuff's food so i'm just going with what the fda says saying it's food and working with quality control and that's the brand and that works because that's what people who are actually into it that aren't trying to convert people to it or avoid it are that's what they care about so i'm meeting exactly what people care about that they don't even know is what they care about and serving the people who are already converted not the people who are right, not, not into it trying to be <laughs> new customers you're like if you love this come and see me if not the hell with you mm-hmm. Yeah, I, like I say, I take two customers from the people who sell cheap stuff and one from the people who sell expensive right. stuff. But I'm just taking them from competitors. I'm not. I have not created a new market yet. Hello, welcome. Is that Stephen <laughs> Benjamin that just came in? Okay. So, so. But that that's a good example of branding, though, because that is branding. It's like, okay, what are your customers and what do they need? Sometimes they don't know what they need, but if you can find out what right. they're looking for. You can serve them directly, and that may not be something yeah. I care about. Like I wanted to to when I started, I wanted to do like super super right. high quality. I wanted everything to be organic, grown in America, just like the farm right. to table movement, but mm-hmm. with supplements. It's impossible. It's not impossible, but I mean, unless you've got like five million to drop on it, it's not going to happen. So I had to, I had to find a middle ground where I could price it where people were willing to pay it, but still bring the right. quality that they. We're currently that's laughing, laughing between those two that, that sort of the ultimate Mercedes of a product. And then it's like, okay, let's go Camry, maybe a Subaru or a Honda and, and pick your sweet spot and you go for it. And, and yeah. you can go basement or you can go to the ceiling. And it, it, there's a market for both. So it's uh, it's good to have a little bit of objectivity. Yeah. One of the things, Matt's calling back in, one of the things I will say about a brand uh, is that it should do two things simultaneously. It should attract people and repel people simultaneously. 
a good brand will do that. Like Apple has people going, I will mm. never touch those products. And other people are like, don't take it away. I will, you know, they love it. So it's like once you're dancing in that zone with a brand, where you have, <laughs> where it's creating that tension and it doesn't serve and no brand serves everybody outside of oxygen. And it's, mm-hmm. it should repel people and attract them simultaneously. What are your thoughts? I agree. I, I have agree. to jump off also, so that's why I'm saying I agree quickly. It's good too, talking to y'all. Hey, if anybody else has a question, please jump in. We're about to wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Uh, we ran a little over time, but uh, hey, we're having a good time here. Let's do it. So sorry, Rico, you were saying that it's not okay to have a brand both attract and repel? I'm saying great brands do both simultaneously. Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay, sorry, I misheard you there. No worries. No worries. It's, uh, yeah, it's, the, it's that notion of picking your zone, picking your lane, and focusing on it. It's one of those things a lot of the people that I deal with sometimes are startups. And they're like, I want to appeal to everyone, and I, want, you know, I don't want to miss any piece of the market. I want to have a brand that's like loved by everyone. I'm like, okay, that's not going to happen. And then we, we whittle it down and whittle it down, and we get it down to a single person beyond a demographic into a persona where this person, you know, watches this on YouTube. They like these products. They eat these Cheetos. Do they eat Cheetos? Like, what is the brand of Cheetos? Do they eat Doritos? Like, so we get into really specific things to the point where you can actually see the person physically and be like, that's my customer. If I walked into a room, how do you pick that person out across the room? Once you get to that zone of being that specific and create the product for that person, then this interesting happens where it becomes magnetic to that type of client and then they start rushing in and you get all types of business. So getting deep and specific is what is one of those power positions uh, when you go to brands. The most is, you know, it's, it's funny you said that and it's funny we, we, we've kind of all kind of brought apples as a concept in this equation. Uh, if you think about when Apple first came out, they were Apple computing mm-hmm. um, and they were selling, you know, of course, selling computers mm-hmm. and they stripped computing mm-hmm. and they say, we want to be Apple because we want to be an innovation company. Right. We want to innovate. We want to do iPhones, we do iPads, we want to do, you know, all these different things. Yeah. So we don't want to be known as computer, we want to be known as innovation. Well, now, it, it look at the, where they uh, are now. The luxury you brands. Know, they're struggling. Well, mm-hmm. they're, they're struggling because it's hard for them now to become leaders in innovation because everybody's trying to beat them to the watch, <laughs> beat them to the eye water or whatever the next thing. Everyone's trying to, you know, I mean, but see, Samsung came out with the watch first, not because they had a better watch, but because they didn't want to, they didn't want Apple to beat them. I mean, they literally said it. They wanted to be, yeah. be the first and they knew that they had some bugs. Some things you need to fix, but they were like, they did not want Apple right. to keep coming out with the first everything. And believe it or not, that was one of the most brilliant things they did. I thought it was a mistake in the beginning. I thought it was somewhat problematic not to put out a solid product, mm-hmm. knowing that there may be, you know, issues. But it actually began to have people reevaluate Apple's Apple and say, "Are you now the leader in, in innovation?" And think about it. He mentioned Steve Jobs. Since Steve Jobs has left, what have they They've gone backwards? Innovated? What yes. new thing have they created? They're putting out phones now that look like They've old phones. Ba- there you go. They've yeah. gone backwards. Let's do the phone from three years ago it's, and call it a new phone. It. <laughs> no, you, but you you nailed it, dude. No, Matt absolutely nailed it, and that's where I was headed. The next thing I was going to say is now they're taking old stuff. Yeah. And trying to resell it. That's not innovation. But they sold. We talked about confidence in motion, right? We talked about the best or nothing. We talked about uh, a crown for every achievement. All these great taglines and position statements that these Mm -hmm. brands have created. Well, what was Apple's? Think different. (laughs) They're not thinking different anymore. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you you begin to pivot a brand that is that size and that wide. It's become a dinosaur. Apple used to be this niche boutique type, you know, artisanal product. And now it is as mainstream as anything. It's it's the epitome of mainstream. It is as huge as anything else. So how do you, I mean, think of it this way, an, an Apple iPhone 
sells more in three months than the entire annual revenue of General Motors. That's one product. Like, how do you begin to innovate wow. when you're that big? Wow. Slowly. That's, that's, you're trying to have a whale do donuts. I'm like, hang on. Yeah. We need about yeah. a 10 mile radius for them to start doing anything. I'm like, what? I don't know. You know, I've, I've heard a great philosophy. You got a big difference. Thank you, boy. <laughs> if you have, so I think we, we spoke about this before we went live. Your budget is 100%. You have 100% bandwidth to do whatever you want to do. Billions of dollars in cash at your disposal. So dedicate 10% to thinking different. Just take a little bit. Just see what happens there. Just make an investment, a high-risk investment with 10% of your money. Um, there's a great shop that I freelanced at and they call it, um, you have your campaign and the campaign is going to be hardworking. It's often very tactical. I remember you telling media me media stuff. And then they, they dedicate 10% for a statement piece, something that'll get talked about, something that will earn them PR, something that's a little bit different than the billboards, the TSAs and the radio ads they're putting out. Mm -hmm. They've dedicated a certain amount to being a little bit different and just see where it goes. Right. And I think so that, that work that could get you an award. It's just like, it's just open. It's, it, you know, oftentimes that work does get you an award. Mm -hmm. um, but it's done more for the sake of, you know, it's, you do it all the time with something as, as, uh, as granular as subject lines in emails. What's going to get opened more? And you can do testing. Right. So you try to figure out what's going to work best. I think that yeah. if, if Apple yeah. wants to start to innovate again, they can. It's not about reinventing all their products. Right. But they can start to do something a little different and start there and then see how that goes. Yeah. And keep, you know, it goes back to that quote. I, I think, I feel that Apple's also, it's building the stuff that people expect them to build at this point. I wonder if there's research groups or something that are just pushing mm. them into the wrong direction. But I they don't understand how with a uh, research group, they were like, screw everyone. We're just going to put creatives and we're going to put uh, Jonathan Evie in a room and say, if you had to invent a phone today, what would you come up with? Bye. And uh, they came up with the iPhone. Just given technology, they wiped the keyboard out. They took this off. And when that came out, it was a tenfold leap in the industry. And I remember uh, Microsoft had a comment when they, just before they released the phone to say, congratulations you've invented the most expensive phone in the world. And Steve Jobs responded with, it's not for everybody. And the lines went bananas, like the rest is history. So it's like, how it, yeah. and I mean, creativity is what turned the company around with Jonathan Evie years ago, creating the, the new iMac, creating the, the blueberry and the orange and the tangerine and putting colors in these things. I mean, this is where creativity is what drove that company all along Steve passes away, and they start marching in in in, in spots, so to speak, in place. And it's it's yeah. really, I mean, they have grown. I mean, they're huge. They had enough inertia to keep going. But uh, where's the new phone? I'm not wowed by anything they've released. It's been marginal increases over the years. And I love Apple. I'm like, I'm an Apple fanboy. I'm like, yeah, come up with something other than touch. Like, you can do better. I expect more from a company that has think different in their tagline. Now, I'm, I'm, I yeah. agree with Matt. They, they, they appear to move backwards. Um, you know, they appear to kind of lost the innovation aspect of, um, of how they reconnected with everyone. Uh, I, I don't think they're, they're delivering on that promise anymore. And I think their stock reflects that. Um, I think, um, even there's, even yeah. look, even though their sales are still astronomical, I still think their sales right. still reflect that the loss of sales still reflect that. Cause I remember a time when, when Apple was only like, what, 4% of the PC market and you know, it, it was, it was small. I mean, now people, people, you go into a coffee shop or, you know, people got MacBooks just because it looks cool. It looks sexy. You know what I'm saying? You know? It looks cool to have that that Iron Man Apple logo lit up on the back, you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, but you're right, you know. I I think the uh, the innovation yeah. aspect. I think Matt's is, a little bit frozen. Definitely. You may want to log out, log back in to refresh that, Matt. 
<laughs> it's a great picture. Though. I thought you had fell asleep. The saltiest police. He's like, oh, you bore me. <laughs> I'm going to kick you out. Technical <laughs> issues. I'm sorry, guys. Is that it? I'm going to kick you out so you come back in. So you no, you, no, you're fine. Okay. There you go. So when he comes back in, I think we're going to wrap up the show. I think we've gone over. But it's good. I mean, this has been... Amazing, man. We've got some, oh, great some great yeah, stuff great here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, and watching. I see Benjamin. <laughs> hey, what's up, Stephen? He's coming in and out. We've got Dr. Vibe in the house, Andre, uh, Tim McVon. Thank you for being here. If anybody has a question, now would be the time to jump in and get before we leave. Brent, I did is. Uh... Share something. He said uh, Apple's R and D spending hit 8.1 billion in 2015 to just continue work on massive projects. <laughs> you know, um, that's a lot of money to be spending research and development. You know what I'm saying? Um, but you know, it, sometimes yeah. it's not how much yeah. you spend; it's what you're spending it on, too. You know, um, and I think that's where that, that's where. Future. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm not gonna say no, anything you know, other than fear the future. That's... Google it. <laughs> Well, but you know, they just invested in the, uh, like a billion yeah, yeah. dollars in this Chinese Uber uh, platform company. Uh, everybody's been talking about the next step they're going to go in it has to be something yeah. in the automotive industry. So I, I could yeah, totally see that. Yeah, an Apple car would be, would be, that would be, a, that would be a baller <laughs> logo. Pull it up, man. I'm not even going to lie to you, dog. I, and you know, and you know, they're gonna come up with like all the different colors, right? You can get the, the gold. <laughs> Roll. They're not even gonna be stealing the emblem anymore. Right. They're gonna rip um, off your fender and be like, "This is gold, guy." Exactly, exactly, exactly. Hey, Brenda, I did say Siri might have to work then. Yeah, they, she better work plane. if you got the car. <laughs> It'd be great for you navigate. Rose gold plane. That would be a car or plane. Yeah, I, I think something's coming. Um, something's definitely coming. I think they I look if if we if we're having this conversation, I'm pretty sure they've had this conversation a million times. You know, they they they've seen them they've they've definitely been like, hey, you know, we gotta do something. Right. You know, we we're not innovating like we used to, you know. And I don't think Tim Cook wants to be the guy that failed after Steve Jobs died. Yeah, I, that's gonna, gonna be honest with you. I don't think he wants to be that guy. The resume on your link. Like, oh, you that? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, man, dude, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, 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 you know, that's, that's, that's not the way Andre you want to go. Andre McN. What's up, Andre? He's just coming in. Yeah, man, you missed a serious conversation today, but uh, catch the replay. I see, I see Wag is in, man. I've had Wag. a couple combos with Wag. Wag's a brand guy. What's up, Wag? Wag. Yeah, yeah, he's a brand, brand guy. guy. He's got the glasses. What's up, shirt. man? He's ready to go. No, Vice no. President of Strategy. Yeah. Good to see you, man. Yeah, well, we've had some really good conversation. Matter of fact, um, I don't know if he worked with uh, Zimmerman Partners, but I know we've had some, um, mm. we both kind of had some experiences, um, you know, with, with some similar agencies uh, in Florida. Uh, okay, friends, yeah, yeah. I think you, you're, you're in Florida, no, right? Conversation, right? man. We're both I think he's in Florida, too. <laughs> Orlando, yeah, okay, right around the corner. Right around, yeah, no, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a nice. brilliant mind. Man. Well, if nobody's jumping in, I don't know if Matt's coming back in. Uh, any more questions? Now's the time. We've got about one minute to go before we get off. But I wanted to thank everybody for being here and joining us on this blab. It's been my pleasure to host this and have these conversations. I love branding. I love design. And anytime we can get into these conversations, I'm game. And... Askia, how can people get in touch with you or what's next? What's the next big kapow that's happening in your life? I know you're working on stuff. Kapow. Man, you know, I'm, I'm working on some projects. Uh, I still do some consulting. Um, you can, you can, my uh, consulting site is platpart.com. Um, but, uh, but I'm also working on some independent mm -hmm. projects as well that I'm launching. But um, but that's how you can find me. But or, or you can just if, if you hit me up on Twitter, you'll see all my information. So you can you, know, you can pull all my catch all him my on Twitter. Yeah. I'm gonna put your URL in there, Plaid Park. Of 
course, man. And oh, Matt thank you, thank you. Uh, is on Twitter. You will see his bio and his link below this once we are finished. So connect. Yeah, I man, great have. I mean, I, I don't see Matt in the room, but man, great conversation with Matt. Man, I, I love, I love, I love, I'll know. As a former creative director, I not only enjoy working with writers, but I also have kind of envied writers. But but I didn't want to be a writer. I didn't want to be the one in the fetus position, position at words. one a.m. You know, under, under the desk. You know, <laughs> like I need the words. <laughs> Copy. <laughs> But um, but now, nah, but you know, it's I think that that's that's one skill set. I think people, you know, because like I said earlier, you know, great brands begin with words. They don't begin with design. They begin with words. And and um, I think that the copywriting aspect is uh, something that I just uh, you know, you know, people don't really understand. So it's you know, I, I like you know when I get a chance to to, to uh, collab with writers and have conversations with them. All right, man. Well, treat. that is it. If you need to connect with me, my name is Ricardo McCray. You can find me on all platforms under that name. Reach me on Twitter under the same name, Ricardo McCray. We love you. Thank you. And we'll see you next time in the Blabosphere, people. <laughs>